Good afternoon. I've been told I've got about 20 minutes and I'm assured that's not to shut me up from talking once I go in, but to allow you time to ask any questions uh, at the end. Uh, the only thing I'll say about that is if we do overrun and you can please think of any nefarious questions, Paul is here all afternoon. Uh, so, yeah, so. Um, so a little bit about myself, uh, Andy Morris, I'm the Community Inspector at Boston. Uh, that means our, our areas are aligned to the council areas, so I am responsible for neighbourhood policing across the Boston borough uh, area, the entire area, that's mine. Uh, and it's my job to do all the community engagement, crime reduction, uh, crime prevention strategies. Um, I was born in Cleethorpes, uh, born and raised in Cleethorpes, worked Skegness, I was the Skegness Sector Inspector before I was the uh, Boston Sector Inspector, and I have been crabbing in Cromer, so I think I am actually qualified <laughs> to, say, to say that Mablethorpe is probably the, the Premier. <laughs> so um, so th that's, a, that's a little bit about me. So I, I came to Boston uh, sort of back end of 2015, beginning of 2016. I had a rough idea of what I've let myself in for. I was quite an experienced neighbourhood policing inspector, having done it for a number of years. Uh, I'd read the paper. My impression very much was uh, what I'd read in the paper about what I was letting myself in for. So I'd seen all the murder capital of the, of the UK and <coughs> the fattest town in the UK and all these negative stereotypes. Uh, and, and that's what I came for. However, when I landed, um, suddenly I'm also told that I'm responsible for community cohesion. Now, I'd never heard those two words together before in, 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 you know, in a sentence. It, so what does that actually mean? Um, well, the strategy is to deliver cohesion in the community. So tactics are down to you, Andy. <laughs> off, off you go. <laughs> so, OK, so I'll, if, I, if I look at the way Dr. Bretterton the, uh, the, on the video sort of said, so basically I've started with a new relationship and thought I knew where I was going, and then suddenly there's this fear because I've got this community cohesion project. So I, I go into this fear cycle, but I thought, you know what, I know we live in the 21st century, someone's pointed out earlier, we've got internet, this is easy, I'll just Google it, I'll Google it, although I should point out what the search engines are available, obviously. <laughs> um, so I, bearing in mind what I'd read in the paper, my impression of the town was what I'd read in the paper, so I thought, you know what, this is the way to bust this myth then, it's all based around perception, the way to bust the myth, it's because people... It's what people see, what people hear, what people feel that I think is responsible for cohesion. If you're told negative stories all the time, you know, this is, this, that's your impression of the town. It was certainly mine. So I got Google out and I thought, I know what I'll do. Visible benefits of diversity. See what we get. Click, send that. Well, I was horrified because the only thing I got was diversity in the workplace. And it talks about how it's fantastic that women were allowed to work and because of that the Enigma machine was was invented I mean, honestly we're going and, and I couldn't find anything significantly more modern than that uh, so there was this feeling of loss you know, on that cycle I've now hit the loss <laughs> so we sat down uh, and then I did move from loss to stillness and I thought well do you know what if Maybe I know what community cohesion isn't. It, what it isn't is what I've read in the paper. You know, it certainly isn't. And if I move to the first slide, this is the sort of thing. This was the week before I arrived in, in um, Boston. Street drinking. That's not the original picture from the paper, but I will tell you why. And this one here, I think the, the, uh, the, the title on this one was What a Dump, and it's about the rubbish in the park. <coughs> So that was my sort of initial impression. I thought, well, that's definitely what it isn't. That's definitely not cohesion. So let's work from there. Let's work backwards. So if I tell you a little bit more about this, this story, th this, this was actually a story, when you read it, the big title, What a Dump, the story was actually about these wonderful volunteers who'd given their time up, come to the park, cleaned it up, and now the park is absolutely immaculate. The headline, What a Dump. So I'm going to say one of the first things you need to do with community cohesion is you definitely need to get a media strategy in place. You definitely need to work with the local media. This story here, street drinking, I said that wasn't the original picture. It wasn't. The original picture has disappeared off the internet as if by magic because what that story was is basically the media had gone out into the town centre. They wanted a story, a sensational story about street drinking. They couldn't find any street drinkers. So what they did to us, they dressed up a stooge, one of his mates, got him in a hoodie, 
bought him a tin of beer, got him in the park and took a photo. That was the front page of the, of the uh, newspaper. Street drinking runs rampage. Yeah, it's, that, that, was, that was the headlines the week before I arrived. Um, so that's, that's effectively uh, what I walked into. Um, so you know, I, I do think it's all about, it's about perception. So my first thing was, you know, we need to change the perception and the feel of the town. That's, that's where we need to do. Um, so I suppose that's where we was. Fran's going to talk to you about where, where, where we've been since. And then what I'm going to do is come back and talk to you about where we're going in the future. So, but just as an example of perception, I mean, they're, they're obviously perceptions, but you can change perception. Ch perception can be changed. So I'll give you an example. You've all walked in here this morning. You're all wearing co nice, comfortable shoes. I ask you the question, how do your feet actually feel in those shoes? Now, five seconds ago, none of you had a clue how your feet felt. But now suddenly you do. So we can change it. We can influence it. We, c we can put things in people's minds. If you constantly talk about street drinking, people go out looking for it. So we need to, we need to look at the way we change things. So, okay. I'm now going to move on to one of the best community cohesion projects that happened to <coughs> us. EDL March came to Boston. This was actually, as it happened, one of the best things that could have possibly have happened to it, in my opinion. The EDL came to the town thinking they'd get a huge, great load of support. The reality is, was it 14? 14 people turned up. <laughs> yeah. Fair play to them. They are actually brave enough to go and walk through the uh, town anyway. Uh, nobody was interested. What I thought might happen did happen. The Polish community saw these people, didn't realise that they were actually from all over the country. They actually thought this was locals demonstrating against them and wanting them out, and there was real fear. And the Polish community decided, you know, we're not going to have this. We're going to have a counter demonstration, and we're going to walk through the streets of Boston, and we're going to say what our rights are. Did anybody hear about that much? No. No. Yeah. Didn't happen. The reason why it didn't happen is because it was a perfect opportunity, and this is what I say, every cloud has a silver lining. We engaged with the Polish community and sort of said, what is it you're trying to establish? Are you aware that this was a national organisation and only 14 people turned up? Oh, no, we weren't aware of that. Okay, so what is it you're trying to achieve? Because if you have a march, a protest through the town centre, what's going to happen is these people are going to come back and they're going to counter-process you, and you've actually given them some credibility and a voice. So they said, "Oh yeah, that's we don't want to. That's not what we want. We want to we want to achieve. You know, just be part of the community. That's what we want. We're, we're sick and tired of being told we're not part of the community. So actually, that that counter protest from the Polish community, we managed to talk, sit them down, talk to them, and they converted it into a candlelit vigil for Remembrance Day. So they came out on Remembrance Day, and actually, they all walked over the bridge." And there were people from Boston running up saying, what's this? Is this a Polish army invaded? No, 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 it's not. <laughs> you know, this is the day that the Polish celebrate freedom from Nazi Germany. Yeah. Are you aware that one in ten pilots in the Battle of Britain were Polish? Yeah. And it gave us the opportunity to tell these stories. And what started to happen is some of the English that came a little bit anti and were asking about what's going on suddenly started buying candles and standing with them. So actually... It turned out that we managed to make that dark cloud into a, into a silver lining. So that's where we were, and I'm going to hand over to Fran, who's going to tell you what we've been doing since that, and then I'll come back to you and tell you where we're going in the future. Hello, everybody. Right, bit of a pop quiz to start off with, very brief. Right, you're not allowed to guess what the middle one is, because I'm hoping everybody in this room will know that. Nor the bottom right, because that's far too easy. All the rest of the flags, anybody in here able to recognise any of them? Czech Republic, Czech Republic top left. Poland in the top middle. Yeah, correct. Portugal. Lithuanian, Portugal. Romania. Bulgaria, Latvia and Lithuania are the other ones. So these are 
a, a very small part of the community that we, we have in Boston because it's actually made up. If you look at the, uh, the, the makeup of the grammar school, it's not just about these Eastern European countries. We've got 39 different nationalities at the grammar school in Boston. So whilst it's obviously about people from Eastern Europe, it's not entirely about people from Eastern Europe. I arrived um, in Boston in 2005 from London. I was new to the police, I was completely new to the area. Um, and on one of my very first response jobs, I arrived on a local estate and got called a foreigner myself because, uh, <laughs> because I was from the South. Um, they clearly didn't realise quite how foreign because I'm also a quarter Polish, which has come in extremely handy um, as, as things have gone along. Um, Mr. Timmers has already mentioned in 2001 the uh, census in the census in 2001, the largest foreign national community in Boston was the Germans at 249. So things have obviously changed massively in a really, really short period of the time. And that pace of change is obviously uh, quite a difficult one or potentially quite a difficult one for people to cope with. What we're going to do about it from a policing point of view? Well, quite quickly, we obviously realised we needed more engagement for all the reasons that have already been mentioned. I vividly remember the first Lithuanian person I ever uh, arrested. When we got into the holding room waiting to go in front of the custody sergeant, he was cowering in the corner because he thought this was the point that we were going to beat him. This is real. This was only a few years ago. So in terms of how people perceive the police, um, it was obviously very different from one community to the next. So we got out there, we spoke to people, we went into anywhere that would have us, which is pretty much anywhere in Boston, and made a bit of a pain of ourselves. So the community knew who we were, they knew that we weren't going to hurt them. And the next point, naturally, really, was the whole, uh, the whole issue of community cohesion. So we recognised, uh, all those flags that I just put up there, we recognised that the police were there and they were trying to be nice to people. We were trying to help people. We were trying to bring people in. But you can't really bring people into the part of your community if you don't have them as part of yours. Uh, so we got volunteers, lots of volunteers that speak all of those languages that you see on the, uh, the flag set. And we were also lucky to inherit a PCSO who spoke six different languages. All of a sudden, we could start to communicate with the, uh, the community that was around us. Um, so the volunteers were helping our understanding. And likewise, we could say to them, well, what is it your communities actually want? Because I think so much of the time we impose upon communities what we think is best, but we don't necessarily ask them what they would like from us. Um, this lady here is PC Emma Carlin. Now, she is incredibly important in our, uh, our vision of community cohesion in Boston, um, because 15 months ago now, um, we were allowed a whole officer, um, which is uh, in, the, in the sort of terms of the cuts was quite, a, quite a, um, a coup, really. And she is responsible for the portfolio of community cohesion. Now, very much uh, like Andy, she was like, when she arrived, what, what is my job? Get out there, ask people, speak to them, see what they want you to do. And she has been a little bit of a revelation, really. Um, to give you some examples of engagements and things that we're doing in the community, um, start off with the hospital. Huge numbers of people coming into the hospital to work. Um, we've been out there and uh, done integration. Um, so basically people come in, they ask us questions about the law, they ask us questions, where can we find babysitters? Where can we go to certain restaurants? Is Boston really this scary and bad? No, actually it's not. And a lot of what we do is put, putting people in touch with other people. It's not necessarily what you would typically think of policing, but it's about building strong community relations. Um, part of Emma's work with the hospital was something that I had never even considered. Um, she has uh, a large amount to do with um, uh, child sexual exploitation and uh, the abuse of migrants. Um, she had discovered um, through a charity called Hope for Justice um, that a lot of people who wouldn't traditionally speak to police in a, a police station or if you went out in uniform would speak to her because she's a lady in civilian clothing. She's not threatening. She's not typically what you would think of a, a big bad policeman. And she started doing some work with Hope for Justice and found that we had hidden parts of our community we didn't even know. Um, for example, sex trade workers, we didn't realise that we had them. Um, but she went on to provide training to the hospital in wars like gynaecology, where people might be coming in for abortions, perhaps, um, repeatedly. And all of a sudden, the, uh, the NHS people think, I'm going to tell Emma this because this is part of an intelligence picture. Um, so we're finding about communities that we didn't even know about. Faith groups, really important to us. Um, we're quite lucky in that uh, our old community beat manager became a deacon in the Catholic Church. So we've got, uh, we've got somebody on the inside, as it were. <laughs> um, and, and going on to talk about our diverse communities, a lot of people wouldn't even know we have a quite sizable Filipino community in Boston, but we do. Um, we know how to reach out, we know how to get hold of them um, through the church. 
street drinking has already been mentioned. Um, I would suggest that if you went out into our communities and said to them, what are you actually bothered about? Not one of them would say all of the, the, the murders that Mr. Timmons mentioned. Most of them would say dog poo, speeding and street drinking. That's what people are actually concerned about. And the perception is these foreign people come over here, they do nothing all day, they drink, they get free houses, they get this, they get that, they get the other. Well, actually, I now know, as do our teams, what the problem actually is. These people are living in really crowded housing. They don't have enough room in their houses to socialise as we would in our front rooms because that's a bedroom. They can't go into the garden because half of the house is sleeping because they're ready for a night shift. All of a sudden, people start to understand because we're helping them to understand that these aren't bad people. They're just living in a different set of circumstances. And before you know it, you're starting to break down the, uh, you're starting to break down the barriers between people, which I think is very important. Essentially, our team uh, are not necessarily what you might think uh, typically of police officers. We're not racing around on blue lights all the time, but what we are trying to do is to be problem solvers. We're really proud of our community. We're really proud of all the people in it. We want it to be a better place. Um, and the end result of that is less crime, less antisocial behaviour and protecting vulnerable people, essentially. Thank you. Now, I'm going to be really, really quick because I know we're under pressure. So what, what does the future look like? Um, well, this is, this is what we're launching in September, Mini Police. This is uh, kids ni uh, age 9 to 11. We've got the uniform in place. Uh, one of the first things we're doing, we're teaching them CPR and first aid. Uh, they're they're going to be doing uh, road safety. They'll be talking to other kids. In the second term, once they've got a little bit of uh, more confidence, we're looking at the kids teaching cyber safety, actually going into old age uh, care homes and things and, and talking about cyber safety, about simple things. So it's little kids talking to the older generation, just breaking those barriers down. So that's one of the things I'm, I'm countering through. Uh, this one is the next one that we're doing. Uh, one of the things that I'm being told by the communities is that all the uh, EU shops that have suddenly sprung up on West Street in Boston and things like that, we don't have to go in them because actually th the windows seem to be uh, posted up so you can't see inside them. Uh, and actually when we do go inside, we don't know what any of that is, we don't know what to do with it. So, what we've done, we've been around all of the uh, shop managers, sat, talked to them, explained what the situation is. We have a Facebook group, or we don't personally, but, but there's a Facebook group called Boston More in Common. Uh, they've got a, an outreach of about 3,500 people. We've also got a Polish Facebook site which has got about another 3,000 people. <coughs> so about 6,500 people. The local press are involved as well. Uh, and basically what's going to happen is, with some of my volunteers, so not police officers, no police money, but with the police volunteers that we've got that speak all the different languages, they are going to be meeting and greeting people, English people, that can come to the Polish shops, they're going to take you around the shop, there'll be a whole load of tasters, and if you like what you've tried, the Boston More and Common group have written recipe cards that you can take away, so you know what to do with it and everything. Uh, <coughs> first one, if anybody's interested, July the 8th at Korzynka which is just off John Adams Way, which is the main road through the Boston. So if anybody's interested, July the 8th, come and try some Polish food, break those barriers down. It's just about getting people talking to each other. So apologies that I'm cancelled through that, but I am against time. Thank you.